Hey everyone, thank you so much for joining us once again for our series on the Armor Bearer. We're so appreciative that you take time out of your week to be a part of this discussion and to glean and to watch or listen to these recordings. And uh, we're just so thankful for that. So if you are enjoying these um, on YouTube, Facebook, or uh, in the church app, if you're on YouTube, uh, like and comment on these videos or subscribe to the channel, this kind of helps it helps expand our audience and so that can be a really great uh venue for those of us um but again thank you so much for being a part of our study and for being here um we are in the midst of a wonderful minnesota winter and the ground is going to be white for many months and uh it is lots of fun and uh lots of excitement so uh once again it is just a wonderful time um we are going through the armor bear and i just kind of want to review the beauty of having the recordings is that you can go and review the previous episodes at your leisure and so i'm not going to go in depth too much but last time we met we looked at moses and we looked at the way moses had a couple different armor bearers um we looked at aaron who is this um helper for the work at hand you know there's many tasks that had to get done and so he came alongside Moses at the beginning and really helped Moses um, doing a lot of the work that Moses just was unable or did not want to. He just kind of helped with the initial workload. The next group of armor bearers what is what we call the 70. And the 70 were a bunch of elders of Israel that were delegated unto the task of uh, shepherding the people and, and governing the people. And so these 70 elders are the ones that oversaw the governance of the nation. And they helped uh, lighten the load that Moses was carrying for thousands and thousands of people. The last and the final armor bearer we looked at for Moses was found in Joshua, who was basically this servant leader and how he came alongside Moses to, to serve him whatever capacity was needed. Um, and, and just to wait on Moses, whatever, was, uh, whatever Moses required. And he ended up being the one who would become the next leader of Israel. And so we call him the servant leader. And each one of those uh, types have a different uh, impact when we look at the armor bearer role. And so, again, the beauty of having this online format, whether it's in the church app or on YouTube, you can go and watch those ones. So if you missed one of those, one of these uh, episodes, one of these lessons, it will serve you well to be able to go back and to listen again or to, to listen for the first time at, at that matter. And so it is it is really, really good. And so now we're actually going to jump ahead several generations, many generations, and we're going to look at three individuals through the lens of an armor bearer. And um, many of you, when we get into this topic, if you've been in church for a while, may not have connected these three individuals to that armor bearer principle. But I believe there are certain things and lessons that we can gather and glean from these three individuals that will dramatically impact the, the way we view an armor bearer. And uh, so I want to look at these three. And these three individuals are found in the book of Ruth. And it is Ruth, Naomi, and Boaz. So we're going to look at these three individuals and how uh, the roles that they played and what lessons we can glean from this, no pun intended, um, as we consider this role of the armor bearer. And so um, it is really good. Now, in the text, looking at the word of God, we are first introduced to Naomi. She is an Israelite who is is kind of goes into this self-imposed, uh, I don't want to say exile, but maybe this self-imposed retreat. Um, Israel at the time, the nation is under a famine. And so to get relief from this famine, Naomi, her husband, and her two sons leave the nation, and they go and dwell in the land of Moab. They go live amongst the Moabites, and they go to, to live there. While they're there, um, what happens is that uh, Naomi's husband passes away. We don't know the causes for that, whether it's age or other unforeseen circumstances. But her husband, uh, her husband dies. Her sons have grown, and they take on wives of their own. And so they're there. But of course, the, over the course of 10 years that they're there, her sons also die. So the three men in Naomi's life die, leaving Naomi, 
and two other women, two other young wives, childless and in a, in a state of need. And that's where we're kind of introduced. So these three widows, and this is all found in Ruth chapter one. In Ruth chapter one, you see Ruth, uh, you see Naomi arrive on the scene um, with her family. The men die, leaving these three widows. And that's all found in chapter one right there. Now, what happens is with these two widows, these two young widows, these two uh, young women, so not Naomi, but the other two, is now they're, they, they have to take care of themselves somehow. And they're not there because their husbands have died. They're considered they're widows. They're 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 free to um, without children. They they're free to pursue other relationships, and so they're they're free to pursue other options. And Naomi, however, is beyond child rearing years. She's uh, she's an older woman. She's in the latter stages. She's in the you know the past midlife, and. So she's in a very much different stage of life. And so she is a, a widow and, and no children. And so um, she has to look for other options to take care of herself. Okay. And so she receives word that the famine in Israel has ended. And so she determines to go back. And so what she does is she intends to leave her two uh, Moabite daughter-in-laws. And she wants to leave them behind in Moab so that they can pursue and get new husbands for themselves. Don't wait for the um, uh, 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 kinsman redeemer to come from Naomi because um, are they going to wait, you know, 20 plus years, you know, more, a, a decade or more for uh, her to just even the possibility of bearing a son um, that could take care of them? There's just not a chance. And so she's determined to leave them. And, and she even ex and, and exhorts them. Yes, they all are very well uh, emotionally connected. But she tells them, no, 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 you, you, you need to stay. You need you have options here, please. Um, and so uh, initially the girls wanted to go with them. Um, but one does listen to Naomi. One does listen to her and returns to her people. And the other does not. And this... This other that we're going to look at, and we, we know her name, and I'm just we're just maybe drawing the matter out by referring, re, referring to her in a third person type of way. But what's amazing is one makes the decision and goes with Naomi's suggestion and returns to her people to be provided amongst her people, find a husband amongst her people. But the other one, Ruth, does not, and she actually makes a very big armor bearer decision and so we're going to read that actually in the text so i'm going to be reading from the niv um and it is in ruth chapter one ruth chapter one and we're going to read verses 16 through 18 so listen listen to what he says here it says but ruth replied don't urge me to leave you or to turn back from you where you go i will go and where you stay i will stay your people will be my people and your God, my God. Where you die, I will die. There I will be buried. May the Lord deal with me, be it ever so severely, if even death separates you and me. When Naomi realized that Ruth was determined to go with her, she stopped urging her. So this very big decision. She makes this big armor bearer decision. And... It, and I, I really want to point out these principles here because it starts with this idea. Now, why why would she say, where you go, I'll go, your people, my people, your God, my God? And it, it, it starts with this affectionate, uh, it starts with, I want what you got. I, I want to be a part of where you're going and what you're doing. I want to be with you. Um, a very, very well connected uh, point of view. And... But that is a wonderful thing. See, for Ruth to follow Naomi, it meant that she had to leave her family. She had to leave her culture, her land, her her worship, the kind of worship that the Moabites did. She had to leave everything that she knew as a Moabitess and leave that all behind to follow Naomi into a different land, a new land, um, and go into something that is completely foreign to her. Okay. Again, the heart of the heart of this principle in the armor bearer of this 
part of our account here as we consider this, the armor bearer is declaring, I want your way of life. You know, I, I want your way of life. I want to um, I want to learn from you. I want to walk the way that you walk. I want to speak the way that you speak. I want to uh, worship the God that you worship. I want to learn from you. This is the heart of an armor bearer. Um, in, in leadership, one of the key things that is so important uh, with armor bearers, um, having that heart of a, a servant, having that heart of somebody who wants to serve and love on people, it comes to this this point where you you, it, you want to serve them so willingly because they they impress you. You you see this amazing commander, general, uh, pastor. Uh, you see this leader among men, and you, you think to yourself, "I I want what they got. I I this man's impressive. I get this. This is my leader. This is my commander. This is my chief." To use expressive terms, and you know this is a huge thing because it is. I want this. Now, see back to Ruth. See Ruth's making this declaration, but she has no guarantee that she's going to be taken care of. She's she's going into something completely by faith. She's going to come, come completely by uh, a, a fresh understanding, and so she has to make this um, this declaration by faith and this guarantee for her. For her, it's better to go with Naomi. And so I, I want to note something here about the armor bearer because it's this: armor bearers are not swayed or influenced by ambition um they're willing to serve they're willing to go with somebody because that somebody has something that they want yes but there's no um, and they're they're willing to go with an individual even though there's no guarantee of promotion there's no guarantee of provision there's no guarantee and so there's no there's no possible way that you could have any sense of ambition by going in that servant, unguaranteed position. And that's huge. We, we live in a time where ambition is the biggest thing. What's your ambition? What do you want to do in your life? Where are you going to go? And so we make it this big deal. When, quite frankly, it's, it's a lot simpler than that for the armor bearer. He, they just want to be uh, amongst people. They want to be serving their their leader and learning from them and gleaning from that experience and so um that's a major thing you know and but again the armor bearer is not swayed by ambition why because there's a con there's there's a need and a contentment of being in that place where i'm willing to help somebody out and that is uh that is huge um it's about submitting submitting to another authority for the sake of learning and continuing their ways you know um learning how do they do ministry learning how do they how do they preach how do they pray how do they run their office you know how do they how do they drive their vehicle i'm going to uh, shadow this person so that i can learn from them and help them in whatever way they need so that their job is easier and so it is it's, i'm going to submit myself to their authority so that i can grow from it and that is a, a huge thing there and also another thing to important to to note here is that Ruth stuck to her armor bearer um, even when her leader went through an identity crisis. Now this this I wanna I, I wanna kind of point this out. In in Ruth chapter one, verses twenty through twenty two, people are amazed that Naomi's come back to Israel. And they're like, Naomi's back, Naomi's back, and Naomi says, No, 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 do not call me Naomi. Call me Mara, for the Lord has dealt bitterly with me. And she says that primarily, and, and I call it an identity crisis. She's she's unsure of what she's doing. She's maybe even struggling with depression. She's got these uh, negative emotions that she's going through. Yet in the midst of all of this, uh, Ruth still stuck by her, you know. And that and that's and that's a faithfulness that is so wonderful that even when. Our leaders can have a moment of crisis, whether it's an identity crisis, whether it's a personal crisis, or um, even a, a depression. 
that the armor bearer sees that as what it is, as an attack upon their leader or a, a difficulty upon their leader. And so the good armor bearer will stick through those kinds of crises and they would stick with their leader. And so, which is important. But then I also want to turn our, our attention to Naomi because so here's Naomi and she has the heart. She has the heart of her armor bearer in her heart. Her armor bearer's heart is in hers. And I want to explain that connection. Naomi recognized that Ruth's success in whatever her venture is, was dramatically tied to her. It would directly impact her. Ruth's decisions are going to impact Naomi. And Naomi's decisions are going to impact Ruth. And so Naomi recognized, I need to make sure this young woman is taken care of. And so she did that. She enabled Ruth to fulfill her role, and she did so in a way that Ruth benefited from it so wonderfully, okay? She's the one who enabled Ruth to go and glean in the fields. Go and, go and work in the fields and see what provisions we can get. And so Ruth, being the younger of the two, goes forth and goes into the fields and begins to harvest in the fields. She comes back with this amazing uh, gift, and you know Naomi's just shocked. Oh my goodness, whose whose field did you harvest in? And Ruth says, "Why well, is this man named Boaz?" And I and I love this because Naomi could have done any which way, but because their heart for each other, Naomi reveals to Ruth who Boaz really is. He, she reveals Boaz's identity as a kinsman redeemer, who has a a, a level of rights to the family to help save them. And, and so that's an amazing revelation that Naomi gives to Ruth. Again, because she has that heart of her armor bearer, she recognizes Ruth's success is tied to her own. So if Ruth succeeds, Naomi succeeds. And so Naomi is making sure that Ruth is set up for success. As also as Ruth, as the armor bearer, is providing for Naomi and taking care of the needs that Naomi has that Naomi just is unable to get to. And so it is a wonderful thing. Now, see, there's the key. Good leaders, now, not the armor bearers. I'm, I'm, I'm shifting to the leaders. Good leaders, strong, healthy, sensitive leaders are always going, should always have the welfare of their harm, armor bearers on their hearts. So let me simplify that maybe a little bit. A good leader will always have the welfare of his armor bearers on his mind. Why? Well, because we want to make sure that when they succeed, we succeed. When they're able to excel, we're able to excel. And so making sure that their welfare is being taken care of is so important. And so we want to make sure about that. Okay. We want to ask ourselves, what do they need? Do they have a need? If they have a need, can I make, can I meet that need? Can I come alongside them and, and help them? And what, what, what is my capacity to help them succeed? Um, you know, and that's the next question. How can I help them succeed? Because again, their success is tied to my success. And I want to make sure that they, they achieve that success because it does, it, it, it benefits everybody involved. Okay. And so at this point of the story, there's a wonderful transition that begins to take place. And this is very, very key. Um, because this transition begins to take place. Ruth diligently served both Naomi and Boaz. She served Naomi by providing for Naomi's needs and by um, by bringing the food to her and listening to her and making sure that she got what she needed as Naomi also gave her counsel and wisdom. She also served and helped Boaz by helping him with his fields and showing her diligence. And so Boaz got to watch her. He took notice of this diligent woman harvesting in his fields. And so he began to subtly provide for her. I, I love this because he sees her diligence and her hard work. There's something different about her. He notices how Ruth, who is a foreigner in their land, she's, she's not an Israelite, she's a foreigner. And yet she is providing and meeting the needs and caring for her mother-in-law. And, and that's a wonderful thing. So Boaz witnesses this amazing character development in Ruth as how Ruth is providing and meeting the needs of her 
mother-in-law, um, the mother of her deceased husband. And Ruth is, uh, Boaz is noticing this in Ruth, and he's noticing how well she's doing that. And so he begins to uh, take notice of her and begins to subtly take care of her. And I say subtly because it, it is kind of a, a, a fun cook and dagger thing where he does. He, he tells his harvesters who are in front of Ruth, uh, drop extra grains, you know, make, drop whole heads of grain for this woman to pick up. I mean, that, that's a pretty, I can imagine some of the men, okay, this is just on the free. It's not on the Bible, but this is, you can imagine just for a moment as he's telling these guys, drop whole heads of grain for this woman. Drop extra. Just make sure that she gets a ton, and you can see his. You can you can picture his harvesters kind of winking at each other and be like, "Oh yeah, we know who Boaz likes. We know who his favorite is." Um, and so very subtle, but he begins to do these things, and so he he begins to fulfill this. And then something interesting happens in Ruth chapter three. In Ruth chapter three, as he's been he's provided for her, he's taking care of her, and um, as Ruth has just been diligently doing her job, the realization comes to him on who she really is and a role that he has. So in Ruth chapter 3, he, he the Ruth 3 through chapter 4, um, verses 1 through 12, he, Ruth begins to make this subtle approach um, to Boaz to get his attention and to tell him who she is and his role over her. Um, being as a kinsman redeemer, he has the right to redeem and to save the family line, save the, the family inheritance. And so she makes that. And so he begins to take strides to, to take care of this particular armor bearer of a woman. And so he begins to take strides to care for her. He, he, he acknowledges that there's somebody who is closer in line than him. But he and so he goes and makes sure that this man knows about it, and so they begin to take strides, and it ends up resolving in um, in 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 this amazing provision for Ruth in chapter four. Okay, um, she is in faithful service to Naomi, and proves what kind of character she has. And so here's the thing: good armor bearers will always prove themselves in their current assignment. Good armor bearers will always prove themselves in their current assignment. They don't live for the future assignment. They're not working another job and aiming for another job when, when they're going for excellence in their own. They are content doing what they're doing. They are content moving forward. And it, again, going back to that whole idea of striving for a future assignment, that's ambition. And good armor bearers are not about not motivated by ambition they're motivated by by uh by something deeper they're motivated by an affection they're motivated by uh being a servant um and just doing well in their current position and that's what a good armor bearer will do it's about working out their current responsibilities with excellence is what it's about and so that is um that is important um so we don't need to go trying to prove ourselves for a position that we're not in. I think this is is huge. We we don't need to sit there trying to prove ourselves to be in a position when we're not even in that position to begin with. All our job is to work our current one, our current position, our current responsibilities with grace and excellence. And when we do that, God is going to honor that role. God's going to honor that place when we find ourselves in that position. And that's a huge thing. Okay. Humility is vital to a good armor bearer. Ruth didn't go tell Naomi that she knew better or asserting her Moabite culture over Naomi. She humbly accepted her role and worked it with diligence. You know, she could have been like, as a Moabite, this is what we do. You don't know what you're doing. You're not young anymore, Naomi. This is how we do things. Um, she did not assert that. She humbly accepted her position and worked diligently with what was set before her. And in due time, God took care of the rest. She didn't tell Boaz what to do. All she did was reveal herself and then stepped back and allowed Boaz to do the rest of the work. And I love this. She, she did not tell him what to do. She just went, revealed herself, went forward, and Boaz did the rest. 
all she did was walk in humbly and allow things to happen. And that is a, a beautiful position. Okay. So all the while, she is learning, watching, and growing in her armor bearer position, becoming more and more like her leader. Okay. Because of her humility, her diligence, and her servant's heart, God blessed her big in his time. Um, she is listed as one of the very few women and one of the few non-Israelite individuals in the genealogy of Christ. There's, a, there's an amazing thing that she has. And also that she is the grandmother. She's listed publicly as the grandmother of King David. And so she was blessed because of her humility. She was blessed because of her diligence. And all she did was to seek to honor those who were above her and around her and lived to honor them and serve them to the best of her ability. For the armor bearers of our day, serve well, watch out for ambition. I mean, this is huge. This is for our armor bearers. We don't need to sit there and be ambitious and try to outgrow or, or maneuver ourselves beyond a place where our current assignment is. And that's a, that's a huge thing. God will do a great work in our hearts when we faithfully serve him in our current assignment. You know, and we got to trust him to move us up in his timing. When he's when 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 the Lord says we're ready for it, we can wait for him to move us. One of the things in my personal life, uh, part of my testimony is I knew since I was 18 years old that the Lord had called me to be a pastor. So for eight, since I was 18 years old, um, I knew the direction I was going in. I knew what my career was going to be. I knew what God needed me to do. But I also knew that there was some things that I needed to walk in grace with. I needed to yield myself to, to the Lord God and, and to trust him to provide and make my path for me. So I did not need to strive. I did not need to maneuver. I didn't need to do anything. I just needed to, to faithfully serve wherever I found myself. In whatever role I found myself, trusting God to, to, to guide my steps. And so it came to this amazing uh, thing. I, I love doing youth ministry. I love ministering to teenagers. It's exciting. It's fun. Uh, I still get a lot of energy out of it. Um, it hurts because I'm getting up there, but uh, it's seen by this. But, uh, you know, it is still really uh, an amazing experience. And so, but I also knew what God called me to do. And so I just, I, I settled myself in my current assignment and I yielded myself to those over me and to some of the men, to all the men really, but to, to one in particular, I made the decision that I would be their best armor bearer that I could be for them. And that when it was time for me to position up, when it was time for a promotion, when it was time for the next thing that I would trust the leadership and understanding of the men and women that I served under. So the persons that I was armored bearer for, I waited for their acknowledge that it was time for me to get going to the next thing. And, and that's what happened. I was serving a, a wonderful pastor in Southeast Texas, and the Lord uh, gave him certain words for me that I've been praying about. Um, faithfully serving as best I can, and then just waiting for that revelation that it was time for me to step up. And he said certain words. He said certain wonderful, blessed, very affirming, very good words that just things I've been praying for. And the Lord began to just reveal to him, it's time for Ryan to be moved up. And so he he acknowledged that to me. And and then I began the process realizing, okay, my, my role in this area is coming to a conclusion and it's time for me to step into the next role. But it's something I submitted to my leader. It's something I submitted to those above me because I was their armor bearer. And so submitting yourself to spiritual authority, if you're in an in a armor bearer in a church or in a ministry position, submitting yourself to those over you is a great first step of being a good armor bearer. And recognizing that authority. And we'll talk more about this as we go. Because again, the whole topic of the armor bearer is where we're taking our time. Um, but Ruth really displayed that. But it's not about ambition. It's about just faithfully serving wherever you find yourself. And then trusting God to make a way. And, and God to direct your steps. That's what a good armor bearer does. Now for the leaders. Now transitioning to the leaders. It's important that we always seek the welfare 
of those who are are, are underneath us, those who are arm are armor bearers. We want to seek their welfare. Why? Because when they succeed, we succeed. When they have a victory, we have a victory. And <clears throat> their performance as our armor bearers can make or break an individual or a ministry. And so we want to make sure that they get all the tools that they need so that they can serve in excellence. You know, this is kind of the the key illustration back at the very beginning with um, Adam and Eve when we looked at the very first episode of The Armor Bearer. Um, you know, what's important about that is recognizing how amazing it is that the, they come alongside you to help you succeed in your role. And then when they succeed, you succeed. And so as leaders, we need to recognize that their successes is, is our successes and that we carry these burdens together. And um, it is just a wonderful thing. You know, as, as somebody who's been an armor bearer, it is so exciting and, and wonderful and very equipping when they invest in in the in in, in us, when they invest in uh, staff pastors or ministry leaders, lay, lay uh, laity leaders, when when the leader invests in his armor bearers, it's such a wonderful equipping that we get to receive from that enables us to do our job with even a greater heart, with an even greater drive. Because again, even if it's just as simple as my leadership believes in me. And that's a very big and important thing. And so, again, this is all just one of those things that we can gather from just the book of Ruth as we see her heart of humility and to 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 be obedient to her leaders and to, to serve them to the best of her ability. It's a wonderful example uh, of someone who operates within that heart. So I hope you got a lot out of that today. I, I, I hope it did not go too long for you, but I hope that you enjoyed this discussion overall of this. And so thank you for joining us for this part of our discussion. If you're in the area, the southern Minnesota near Albert Lee, we would love to have you join us here at the church, Albert Lee Assembly of God. We meet every Sunday morning. We have 9 o'clock is discipleship, 10 o'clock is worship, and then we have prayer on Sunday nights at 6 p.m. And then our midweek is on Wednesday nights. We have a, a fundraising dinner at 5.30, and then our class groups meet at 6.30, we got something for everybody. We got a men's group, women's group. We've got a, a seniors class. We've got the adult Bible study, a youth group, and kids ministries. And we would love to have you join us if you're in the area. Now, if you're watching these and you're not in the area, we appreciate that you take part in these videos and that you are uh, a big part of, a, of this community. And we are so thankful for that. We ask that you uh, join us live. We, we, have, we live stream our Sunday mornings at 10 o'clock is the live stream on YouTube. And we would love to have you uh, join us on the live stream. And uh, of course, if you're watching this, then you are already more than halfway to our midweek service. We release our midweek videos every Thursday morning at 7. And we are so thankful uh, for your participation. If you're enjoying these videos, let us know that you're enjoying them, that you like these online studies and uh, like these videos, comment on them, uh, subscribe to the channel. It just helps to the way that social media works, the interactions with the channel actually helps boost it so more people can get to see our content and that helps spread the gospel more. Uh, if you'd like to give financially to help us improve our equipment, to help us prove uh, the things that we do here at the church, we are always open for that. There's a link in the description below for you to give. If you have the church app, you can give electronically through the church app and that just helps increase our ability as a church and the mission of, of spreading the gospel. And uh, But we are so thankful for that. We love you. We appreciate you. Thank you so much for being a part of this discussion. And we just ask that you have a wonderful, wonderful rest of your week. Thank you so much. Have a great day. God bless.